The man picked up a wooden stick, took a deep breath, and found the right moment to jab it into the gears. The machinery in the refinery immediately came to a halt. Without the roaring noise as a guide, the zombies below instantly stopped in their tracks, standing dumbfounded in place. Only one zombie quietly approached them, but Mac noticed it in time. Before they could take action, however, the zombie fell into the pipe. They looked inside and were horrified by the sight. All the zombies that had climbed to the elevated platform had fallen into the pipe. No wonder the pressure in the refinery had been consistently high. Just as they were discussing the situation, the jammed gear violently shook. The wooden stick was crushed and flew out, scratching Mac's face. To make matters worse, as the machinery resumed its operation, the noise attracted the zombies again, completely drowning out the music box in Cassandra's hands. One by one, the zombies turned back and continued towards the highest level. Unable to do anything, Addie reluctantly abandoned her baseball bat for now. The effect was immediate, and the zombies stopped once again. They didn't linger on the upper levels for long, quickly returning to the ground to regroup with their teammates. They explained the situation to them. Garnett, upon hearing the situation, felt a chill down his spine. They needed to hurry and fill up the tanker truck. Delays could lead to unexpected consequences. Roberta honked the horn to signal the others. Cassandra placed the music box at the entrance of the drainage pipe, immediately drawing the attention of the zombies towards another direction. Seeing that it was effective, Roberta hit the gas pedal and quickly drove the vehicle forward. Garnett held the pipe securely in place. Max swiftly flipped the switch, and gasoline began to flow into the tanker. They finally breathed a sigh of relief. Everything was going according to plan. Meanwhile, in the nearby vehicle, Doc and Murphy were chatting. Suddenly, a zombie appeared outside the glass, clawing and snarling. Murphy's face paled as he was filled with panic, haunted by the memory of being attacked by eight zombies before. Doc tried to reassure him that it was just a couple of small zombies, and they were separated by the glass. But Murphy was still scared. Doc had no choice but to open the door and go out to deal with the zombies outside. Murphy still thinks he's in danger, so he locks the car door. Doc was ready to take care of the zombies one by one. After dealing with one zombie, he rushed up to kill the zombie on the hood. However, another zombie lunged from the side, wearing a helmet that prevented Doc from killing it. The person attacking was none other than 10K, who had initially taken the high ground. At this moment, Murphy was overwhelmed with fear. Just as Doc finished speaking, he fumbled with the car keys, trying to escape. The vehicle behind them suddenly surged forward. Back at the refinery, Cassandra held the music box. Playing the music, Travis got closer to her and said, This is good. We'll wait for these idiots to fill up the tanker and then we'll steal it, and they'll be rewarded for their efforts. It was evident that they knew each other. However, Cassandra seemed eager to distance herself from Travis and didn't want to go back to that organization. Travis threatened Cassandra, saying that if she didn't listen to him, he would reveal her true identity to their friends and see if they would accept her. Cassandra didn't want to get entangled with Travis anymore and decided to run away, preparing to leave the area. But before she could take a few steps, she reached a dead end. Travis blocked Cassandra's escape route. Travis wore a smug expression as he slowly approached Cassandra, pulling out a weapon he had on him. He lunged at Cassandra, shocking her neck with an electric shock and then striking her abdomen. Ordinary people would have collapsed and fallen to the ground. But Cassandra seemed unfazed. Cassandra kicked Travis down, and what awaited him was being slowly devoured by the zombies. Roberta and the others also had an accident. The decompression valve gear got stuck, causing the pressure to continuously rise. The entire machine started trembling, on the verge of collapse. They gazed nervously at the zombie-covered pipeline. The consequences would be unimaginable if the pipeline burst open. Garnett quickly made the decision for them to get on the car and leave the area. The car had enough fuel to last a long time. But before they could leave, the pipeline couldn't withstand the pressure and the valve burst open. One by one, the zombies rushed out from the inside and they were horrified at the sight. The zombies stood up and stared at them with empty eyes, wrapped in black oil. They appeared even more eerie and terrifying. They took a deep breath and picked up iron rods from the ground, preparing for the fight. But deep down, they were already filled with fear. The zombies slowly approached them, growling as if they wanted to devour everything in front of them. Roberta tried to remove the oil pipeline, but it was stuck and wouldn't come out. The zombies were getting closer, their roars echoing in their ears, as if they wanted to consume them. Luckily, Garnett assisted and managed to pull the pipe out. Now, their priority was to leave this place. However, at that moment, Murphy, the fool, appeared. In an attempt to get rid of the zombies on the windshield, he drove the car back to the oil refinery. 
To their astonishment, the car crashed into the iron scaffolding, the surrounding zombies were no longer interested in Garnett and the others, they were now drawn to the loud noise and surrounded the car, Garnett instructed the others to evacuate while he went to rescue Murphy, who was crucial to saving the world, Garnett swiftly dealt with a few zombies on the other side of the car, opened the door, and pulled Murphy out, but Murphy was terrified, his mouth mumbling incoherently, refusing to leave the car, moreover, the collision on the car created sparks, making the situation even more urgent, Garnett gave Murphy two punches and then dragged him away, they hadn't gone far when the tanker truck exploded, they sighed, realizing that their efforts had been in vain, the burning zombies approached them, and Murphy feels no guilt whatsoever, as if he doesn't know what a mistake he's made, the disdain in their eyes made Murphy realize his mistake immediately, but all he could manage was a simple apology, at that moment, Roberta noticed Cassandra's return and was puzzled why she was the only one who came back. Cassandra said that Travis didn't survive the zombies and didn't mention their past at all. Meanwhile, at the Arctic Command Center, Citizen Z observed the explosion from the satellite and became curious. He found the team he had been searching for and used his hacking skills to call the phone booth nearby. Garnett hesitated for a moment but decided to answer the call. He quickly asked, You want us to take this guy all the way to California? That's too far. We need a closer location. Send someone to pick him up. Garnett also demanded to speak with the leader at the California laboratory. However, Citizen Z awkwardly revealed that he had lost contact with them too. The area had been overrun by zombies, and he didn't know if anyone had survived. Garnett just drops the phone. What kind of shit mission is this? As another explosion occurred at the oil refinery, Addy's baseball bat miraculously flew towards them, it was an unexpected stroke of luck since Addy cherished that weapon, while the rest of the team was feeling down and preparing to leave, 10k returned with two buckets of oil, bringing joy to Doc, who was almost brought to tears, currently, this makeshift team had no specific goal, although they had initially intended to save humanity by escorting Murphy to California, the distance was too far, and they didn't even know if the laboratory still existed, they could only take one step at a time, moreover, Cassandra had secrets, but no one bothered to inquire, in the post-apocalyptic world, everyone had done things they didn't want to mention, after they left, a man arrived at the refinery, one of Travis companions, accompanying him was a middle-aged man wearing sunglasses, Tobias, the leader of a mysterious group, they looked at the dead Travis and guessed that Cassandra was responsible. Cassandra definitely has secrets, and Travis came to find her. She has been evading control from her previous organization. The gang is in Philadelphia, led by Tobias, a complete psychopath. He created a so-called family, where everyone who joins becomes his child. He provides fresh meat for his children, which is considered a luxury in the outside world. However, if you look closely, you'll notice that the men who join are strong and muscular while the women were revealing clothing and heavy makeup. And this numb woman is Tobias' wife and the mother of this family. But these women are not his lovers. They are used to entertain guests. Cassandra was once in the same situation. She was forced to entertain survivors from the outside world. For example, a man could play with her for just three drugs. This seemingly surface-level exchange was actually a scam without any substance, just as the man was lost in his own world. Cassandra pulled out a stun gun from under the pillow and launched a surprise attack. However, the man quickly grabbed hold of her, that's when Tobias appeared, the man was furious, knowing that he had fallen into a trap, Tobias' eldest son, Samuel, was knocked down with a single blow, just as things were critical, Cassandra attacked from behind, helping to resolve the situation, once the chaos settled, Tobias stood up sternly, reaching out for the stun gun and giving the man who had attacked him a couple of shocks, after finishing this, he turned to Cassandra, Cassandra would be punished with an electric device almost every time she made a mistake here. Later on, business became increasingly difficult, and Cassandra was even placed in a cage on the streets of a neighboring city, waiting for a big catch. Unexpectedly, she encountered the Addy Doc team by chance. These people had nothing else in mind for Cassandra, so she had the idea of leaving with them too. Not wanting to go back to being humiliated again, Tobias was extremely displeased when he learned about this. He and family members said, There's a hole in my heart. A hole in this family. Our family's not complete. Our sunshine is missing. The circle that keeps us safe is broken. While they were having a meal, the zombies outside the main gate began roaring, indicating someone's arrival. It was Samuel. He murmurs in Tobias' ear that he has found Cassandra's whereabouts. 
The X team had indeed arrived in Philadelphia and saw the zombies feasting as soon as they arrived. Cassandra, however, was burdened with her thoughts, and no one knew what she was thinking. As they walked, they stumbled upon something incredible. It was the historic bell that symbolized freedom in Philadelphia. Of course, in the apocalypse, this artifact was practically worthless. Roberta checked the car and found gasoline inside. They immediately decided to drive away. Two years after the virus outbreak, almost all the car batteries were dead. But that didn't pose a problem for Mac, who easily fixed it. They continued on their way with the big clock. Sometimes, Z Nation felt like a comedy with many interesting dialogues. Hey, take it easy there. That's the last of your water. No, actually, it's the last of her water. A car appeared in front of them and Roberta swerved to the left. Although they avoided the accident, the trailer seemed to lose control due to inertia. The rope holding the big clock was thrown off and smashed right into some zombies. They all watched in astonishment. Doc even said he would pay to watch the performance again. Now, the car they just found has a bad bearing and they all pile into the pickup again. After traveling for a while, they stopped to eat and replenish their energy. It was their last bit of food. Murphy was so hungry that he started licking the packaging. After this meal, they didn't know where the next one would come from. Garnett came out and assigned tasks. He paired Addie and Mac together to find a way to contact the person at the command center through a radio. The rest of the people split into two teams and dispersed to search for food. They would regroup here in one hour, but they didn't realize that someone was secretly watching them. Undoubtedly, it was Tobias and his family members. After a while, Addie and Mac were walking down the street when they happened to see a police car with a radio inside. The two of them playfully flirted and coordinated with each other, preparing to take care of the zombies inside the car. Mac quietly tapped on the glass to attract attention and then abruptly opened the door, while Addie swung her baseball bat perfectly in sync. Soon after, Mac noticed a few zombies approaching from a distance and prepared to go and deal with them. Addie sat in the car, placed her portable camcorder on the front seat, and began checking the equipment. At the same time, Doc and the others were setting up an antenna to provide convenience for Addie's radio on their end. But just then, while Cassandra was keeping watch, she suddenly saw Samuel walking towards their location. He was definitely here to capture her and take her back. Cassandra couldn't just sit and wait, and she didn't want to endanger her two companions either, so she decided to escape directly. Samuel pursued her relentlessly since his father had instructed him not to let Cassandra get hurt. When Cassandra reached a corner and turned, the zombies, hearing the commotion, turned their attention to them and lunged. Samuel, who failed to complete his mission, arrived at the rooftop to report. After Tobias finished speaking, he looked through his binoculars again, believing that there were other gains to be made today. Tobias was looking in the direction where Addie was in the police car. Just then, as Addie finished connecting the antenna, she heard a crackling sound from the radio. With a hopeful mindset, Addie loudly exclaimed from inside the car, This is Delta X Squad, Command Center, do you copy? Citizen Z quickly detected the signal and grew excited, responding that he was there all along. Upon hearing the response, Addie also became thrilled. But suddenly, Citizen Z heard a strange sound, a kind of choking gasp. He continued to call and all he got in response was noise. In fact, it's because Samuel followed Tobias' orders to take the woman away, so that they could have more family members to pick up their clients. Citizen Z realized something was wrong and kept calling for Addie, but unfortunately, there was no response. It took another 10 minutes for Mac to get to the police car and call out if Addie was done, but then he looked in the car and tensed up. Addie was missing, but her weapons were still there. That's when he saw a female zombie, and his heart sank. Just as he finished dealing with the zombies, a call came through the radio. Mac rushed over to answer it. Mac, without bothering to confirm the identity of the person on the radio, immediately asked if there was a woman who had been talking here earlier and where she had gone. Citizen Z, realizing that something had gone wrong, solemnly replied, We only exchanged a few words. And then strange sounds came through. It didn't sound like zombies. It seemed like she was attacked by humans. That's the situation. Citizen Z wanted to inquire about Murphy's well-being. But Mac, consumed with finding Addie, had no interest in answering these questions. His only thought was to locate Addie. Mac ran a few meters before remembering that Addie's camcorder was still in the car. If he checked the footage, he might be able to identify who was responsible. Meanwhile, Addie woke up but found herself surrounded by darkness. The man beside her removed the hood from her head. Tobias reassured Addie not to be afraid. As the people here were good, they had resorted to force only out of necessity. Tobias, instead of being angry, kindly invited Addie to join his extended family and played a piano piece as an apology. 
Three minutes later, the music ended, and Tobias instructed someone to untie Addie and proceeded to brainwash her. He said, I am the father in this family, we take care of each other, and everyone is for me, and I am for everyone, this has been our way of surviving for the past three years. He gave a gentlemanly wave of his hand, gesturing for Addie to enjoy the meat on the table, which was a luxury in these days. Tobias wasn't offended, he thought the woman would eat when she was hungry, he then called two other women from the family to take Addie and provide her with a new set of clothes. Seemingly confident, Tobias believed that Addie would become attached to this place once she became familiar with it and wouldn't want to leave. Fifteen minutes later, Addie descended from the RV wearing a sexy outfit and heavily made-up face, appearing alluring and captivating. However, she felt like a post-apocalyptic stripper in her own mind. Just as Addie was mentally complaining, Tobias's voice sounded out he was barbecuing. Dinner time was approaching, so he instructed the other two women to make room for Addie. Addie, with a melancholic expression, wondered why Mac hadn't come to rescue her yet. She decided to take a stroll and observe this strange place, hoping to find a way to escape. Then she suddenly noticed a pipe next to her that led to nowhere. As she lifted the curtain, it was dimly lit inside, and she used her lighter to illuminate the area. She discovered medical equipment and various tools scattered around after casually turning on the lights, furrowing her brows. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about this place. On the table, there were all sorts of props, including an electronic scale. It was truly eerie. Addie immediately associated this with the meat Tobias had given her and suspected that it was processed here. 